welcome. Uh, I'm Lars Hallett and uh, wearing many hats. I'm a part-time staff member of Veritas and I'm also a Veritas faculty member and um, facilitator. And then uh, this is going to be my fifth trip to Sweden, which I'm so excited about. I have Swedish heritage, as you might guess, with the name Lars, but um, I did my ancestry and I got like 35% Swede, which is my mostly my mother's side of the family, uh, immigrated from Sweden. So I'm fourth generation here in the United States. And, um, you know, when I found out that there were labyrinths in Sweden, I knew I had to go back kind of in search of my roots and my heritage. And um, I'm also part, part Scott, uh, Scottish. So uh, after I did the facilitator training in 2011 in Sharjah, I met Jeff Sayward there. And I said, Jeff, you know, I want to kind of trace my roots. Um, you know, what do you recommend in terms of seeing labyrinths in Scotland and Sweden? And he said, well, if you go to Scotland, you have to go to Iona. And if you go to Sweden, you have to go to Gotland. <laughs> so I actually went from Chart to Iona and walked the labyrinth there. And then I went uh, from Iona to Gotland and um uh, went to the uh, tourist office and I said, you know, where are the labyrinths? And they said, oh, there's a labyrinth north of town. And I said, oh, I know about that one, but I know there's there's more labyrinths here. And they said, oh, I don't know. Are there more labyrinths? I'm not sure. And, you know, do you know any labyrinths? Hey, no one. Oh, and someone in the office came out and was like, I think there's one at a school uh, north, another, another, like about an hour north of town. And, and they weren't really aware of the labyrinths. So I went to the library and I said, uh, you know, do you have books about labyrinths on Sweden? And they searched and they had no books about labyrinths, not at all, not even about any labyrinths in general. Uh, and then they found a magazine from 1983 that did have an article about it. And it happened to be like a gold mine uh, article um, done by a Swedish researcher named Jan Kraft, who, um, using old archaeological or, or surveys in, in the early 1900s, they did a survey of all, you know, Swedish uh, heritage sites. And so labyrinths were listed among these. And so he went around the island to try to find these labyrinths. And he found um, evidence of over 40 labyrinths on the island. So I had them photocopy this um, Swedish article with these drawings and maps. And then I rented a car and I drove around the island uh, for the next five days, looking for all these labyrinths, and they're all over uh, the island in different places. And some of them, like I would follow the map and I would get there and there would be no labyrinth, but there was like this clearing in the trees. And I was like looking and I was like, where's the labyrinth? It, it feels like it, you know, and then I felt under the grass, I could feel a stone and then another stone. And I actually took my shoe off and I could feel through the grass, the, the rings. And then I started counting, you know, the rings of stone under the grass. And I found that there was a 15 circuit labyrinth, like this enormous, like the Chart labyrinth is 11 circuits. And so this one has 15 circuits. And in the center, there was one stone that was larger, that was still like um, emerged out of the, out of the grass. And I thought, wow, this labyrinth is completely buried here under, but totally perfectly preserved, you know, just in time. So um, so I walked 20 labyrinths in five days and completely fell in love with the island um, and knew that I had to go back. So I took my, my fiance back the next year. And then uh, I um, collaborated with Kimberly and Jeff Sayward and uh, led two tours in 2015 and 2016. Um, and then I had a baby <laughs> with my wife uh and uh the pandemic hit and so while we were raising our little daughter and and going through the pandemic i didn't get back to sweden but now that she's eight years old and the pandemic is you know more manageable we uh we've decided it's time to return so um there's incredible synchronicity around labyrinths as you know but there's a special synchronicity around labyrinths in gotland and uh when I taught Labyrinth Summer School in California, I would just come back and I was like effusing all this love and admiration of Swedish labyrinths. And uh, um, 
one of my students came up to me and said, guess what, Lars? I said, what? She said, I'm from Gotland. That is my family's island. And I said, what? You're from Gotland? She's like, yes, that's my ancestral home. And that is Valerie, who is uh, here with us today and will be the co-leader of our tour. So when I found out that she was from Gotland, I thought, oh my gosh, I have to go back with Valerie. I have to, um, you know, uh, work with her, collaborate with her, um, because she really has the knowledge and the roots, you know, to to connect us to the culture and the stories and the the people of Gotland. So I'd like to introduce Valerie uh, Boudier. Uh, well, thank you, Lars. Yes. yes. So I love that story, Lars, because um, you sent, you emailed me all the labyrinths on Gotland. So the next summer I took that list and I was driving all over looking for the labyrinths. So it's funny, the continuation of that story. Yeah. So I'm Valerie Boudier. My maiden name is Lindqvist. And my family is from the island of Gotland. My father is from the West Coast, from Stankumla, which is just south of Visby. And my mother is from the East Coast, um, the big lighthouse city of Nair and on the East Coast. So I have spent a lifetime going back and forth between the island. And my love of labyrinths um, has only grown because I'm from Gotland and can really infuse my love of labyrinths there. So I spend my time, I'm, my parents are from Gotland. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon. And I spend my time between Santa Fe, New Mexico, uh, where I have a center there called Mongata. And I help people heal from trauma um, using sound and breath work and meditation. So I teach all of those things there. Um, then I also have my family home where I raised my family here in Maryville, Tennessee, where I'm at right now. And in our front yard, um, I built an exact replica, well, as exact as we can get of the Troyubor Labyrinth in Visby, which is about a thousand years old. So um, every time I walk that, I was telling Lars earlier tonight that I always connect with my ancestry. So we can trace our family ancestry on Gotland back to the 13th century. Um, and so we thought, you know, that's good, that's well, but National Geographic did a DNA test several years ago now, and they had pulled these two shaman women out of the ground and they matched all of our mitochondrial DNA to see if we matched with those women. And they were about 8,400 years old and I matched with both of them. Oh. So we've been on that island a long time. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's fascinating. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Valerie, what is your sense and feeling when you're on the island? What is it like for you to return there? For me, it's always a sense of deep connection, deep magic. It is my happy place on the planet. And we'll be there in the summer. Everything is vibrant. Everything is alive. We have 24 hours a day of sunlight and all the fields are filled with wildflowers and we're known for our special birds that come and visit this time of year. So it's just, everything's vibrant and alive. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, it's so gorgeous. I mean, it's just like anything with the labyrinth. It's like you go there for the labyrinth, but then, uh, you know, you end up finding all this beauty and history and, you know, like just in, like this windmill <laughs> behind me, you know, just on the side of the road as you're driving to the labyrinth, you're like, oh my God, look at that windmill. I can't believe it. So, you know, there's so many kind of things to discover along the road as you drive uh, around. So um, I'll share some pictures here. We'll and uh, the title of our pilgrimage is um, Myth, Magic, and Mystery. Um, and we're working with Veritas, who is our host for the uh, pilgrimage. And, um, you know, you get to see all sorts of things. We're going to be in the medieval town of, of Visby, which is the capital, um, walking the, the labyrinths. Most of them are outdoors, I think. All of them are outdoors, except for the graffiti kind of labyrinths that you see here uh, etched into the back walls of a medieval church. 
Um, and then, you know, just another example, like this Viking rune stone that you just happen to see in the in a field, you know, um, out there um, walking around. So um, Sweden, surprised to learn, actually has more ancient and historic labyrinths uh, than any country in the world. Uh, in terms of surviving, you know, may, there might have been other countries that had more labyrinths, but in in fact, there's 400 walkable labyrinths in Sweden that have survived to today. And that means they're basically like 100 years old or more. Um, and in the US, we've gone through one revival, I think in Australia as well, one labyrinth revival. Um, but in Sweden, they've been through four or five periods of uh, labyrinth um, building and creation and use. So maybe Valerie, do you want to share a little bit about how the islanders relate to the labyrinth through time? Yeah, sure. So the first time is the 13th century and earlier were for uh, fertility rituals or maiden rituals or to worship the goddess. And then from there, um, being an island, I was telling Lars this, we're like a container. And, and in that container, when you have such a small population and on an island, there's a lot of superstition and magic. So the way that translate is we're farmers and fishermen, sometimes and both. We both farm and fish. Um, so the sea is a very rough sea. And so one way that we use the labyrinths is really to walk the labyrinth, to ask for anything bad that could happen to us, to, to catch it in the labyrinth so that we have safe journey to go out and fish and catch what we need. And then when we come back, we walk the labyrinth, one, to release anything that the labyrinth caught, think of it as a net, and uh, then to also give thanks that we made it back safely. And you'll see when you're on the island, there's a lot of memorials and things to entire ships of fishing people, both men and women fish, um, that have sunk or got lost at sea. And so it's a real reality for us. So um, it's really for good luck and good and good catch, good luck and good catch. So we caught a lot of fish. Then in the 19th century, we started putting up lighthouses because our coast is very rocky. Um, and so the, a lot of the light keepers would make labyrinths and we will be meeting um, both our host at our hotel and his mother um, is related to two of the labyrinth builders. So we'll get to hear firsthand why they built those labyrinths. Um, and then, you know, when you're around the island, there's a lot of uh, summering vacation places and at the schools during the 1970s, 60s, 70s, there was a big revival of labyrinths uh, for children to play on um, at either at their school or at the beach. So those are the four primary areas and epochs that we built labyrinths in. Great. Um, and this is uh, another one of the older labyrinths on mm -hmm. the island. Um, it's hard to date labyrinths, you know, like this because they're just out there in the fields. But um, um, this one, a lot of, you know, you you can also kind of tell its history by how many stories <laughs> are told around the labyrinth. And so um, this one in, in Fruyel, um may predate the church. You know, often when you see a labyrinth in a churchyard, you think, oh, the church built the labyrinth. But here, this was a sacred site because the, the Fruyel um, town is a derivation of Freya, you know, the goddess of fertility. And so this town itself is, is an epicenter of um, the, the earlier spirituality and religion of the island. And, uh, and there's not any other medieval church that has a labyrinth in its churchyard. So you know, it it could be that this labyrinth is actually predates the church. And um, um, maybe, Valerie, you could share a little bit about how some of we're going to weave in some of the stories and uh, songs and rituals uh, in our in our week together. Absolutely. So Fruel here is one of the oldest labyrinths on the island dating 
it just a few years ago, about 3,800 to 4,000 years ago, which means it's appearing at the same time that the Cretan labyrinth is um, also appearing. So, you know, we can, it absolutely was existing before the church. And we know at this church that Freya was worshiped, it was built on top of um, a temple that Freya was worshiped at. But also in the neighborhood are a whole bunch of stone ships and a whole bunch of Bronze Age villages. So this labyrinth will be connected with those. So this was a sacred place of worship. So we have to think of Gotland as a container. And though we like to put time and story and myth on this linear continuum, it doesn't work that way on Gotland. It's all in the same kettle of fish and it is all past, present, and future. It's all in this time period of now. So that labyrinth that we were just looking at, I can promise you that during midsummer, there's, there's ceremonies and rituals still being performed there. And you can come back the next day and see all the flowers left and the candles that were burning. So it's um, still living traditions. So on the island, we are a song filled people. We love to sing. And that's it, like during your name day when you're getting baptized. So we have earth based traditions that now have interwoven themselves into the church. The churches currently are Lutheran, but at one time they were Catholic. And those Catholic churches were built on top of Old Norse sacred sites. And so it's still this continuum and you can go into these churches and on the floor you'll see graves and tombstones and the letters are written in the runic old norse alphabet so and we can all read old norse runic alphabets and the rosetta stone of the ruins was found on gotland called the culver stone so during our time on gotland i'm going to be sharing the stories of each place that we're at we'll be partaking in some songs and traditions, different labyrinths have different traditions, and we're very much connected to the land. So the stories of those places is what connects us to the future that's going to happen. So we carry the past with us always through our stories, our songs, and our traditions. We also have special food that we eat on Gotland for different uh, holidays, traditions, and it's very different than Sweden. So Gotland is its own little country in a way. We even have our own language. It's not Swedish. So um, yeah, so we're going to weave that into our labyrinth tour. So you get to really have an experiential experience of being Gotlander for a week. <laughs> That's so great. I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, and one of the stories that we often hear about in many different forms is about the the maiden in the labyrinth, and it's one that we've chosen uh, to to look at because of um, uh, you know the history and the folklore around the maiden. So, who is the lady in the labyrinth that that we sometimes hear about? We have many ladies. It's a convention of ladies. <laughs> so, at Fruel, for example, we know that that came from um, the Vinca time period which is goddess worship um, in Northern and Northeast Europe. And you have to think of Gotland as a bridge between East and West. So along as us being a singing and song culture, the Baltic states, which are 15 nautical miles from Gotland, also share this culture and also Finland. So we share a lot of this culture with them. Um, then we have our Old Norse ladies, which is, you know, Freya and Frigg and um, Ula and, you know, the whole pantheon of Old Norse goddesses. Then we have the ladies of Christendom. So we have the Virgin Mary. And then at St. Catherine's, she's always connected with Mary Magdalene because part of Mary Magdalene's relics were housed in St. Catherine's. And I'm currently looking to see, do we know where those relics are? Have they moved to the Nordiska Museum? Are they still on the island? Or we have no idea what happened to them. Um, and then the big Troyabor labyrinth outside the Northern gates of the city has a great mythological story, which was probably crafted during the pirate age 
we had a great pirate age in the late 1300s. Um, and I'll tell that story when we're there. We also have modern day maidens. So we have um, Annalise, who is Carl's mother, who's gonna share her family stories about um, the lighthouse labyrinths. And then we have Anna Maria Demstedt, um, who built herself in the 70s, the Loma Linda labyrinth. And she's invited us for Fika, which is a great tradition in all of Sweden, but absolutely on Gotland in summer. Fika is where we take a coffee pause, a coffee break, and it is tradition. And it happens at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. and sometimes at 11 p.m. at night in the summer. Um, so we'll be partaking in that. So these are our modern day ladies of the labyrinth. And so, um, and then we have Vita Sterna, which is the white star. She is our founding mother of the island, married to Shilvar, who through magic and bringing fire to the island, raised it up from the sea so that it would no longer see, sink in the evening. So we have this whole pantheon of ladies of the labyrinth. And um, it's not just a myth, it's a viewfinder that we look at life through. So we're gonna explore each one of these lovely ladies and follow that blessing thread and how it pertains to each one of us in our life. Of course, there's a labyrinth walk to follow each one of them. So that's our lady in the labyrinth for our wow. tour. Wow, so rich, yeah. Yeah, I love one of the things about going to Gotland is that you get to experience so many different stories and so many different labyrinths and so many different mm -hmm. settings. Uh, is It's really incredible. Um, so here, as Valerie was mentioning, you know, Gotland is in the center of the Baltic Sea and uh, um, uh, was an incredible, important uh, trade trading center. You know, you can imagine when all the ships were going around with their goods through rivers and the sea, um, you know, a lot of uh, um, Gotland became very wealthy from all the trading that was going on. Um, and Visby is the capital. And so that's where we'll be uh, based for our week. So uh, we'll, we'll have seven days, uh, seven nights, all in the same hotel. So we won't have to pack our luggage and unpack. We can just get comfortable in our rooms and know where we are. And then um, we'll have one day, uh, our first day Monday, we'll be in the town of Visby. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we've chartered a bus to take us on these uh, roads. One, one day we'll head north, uh, one day we'll head east, and then another day we'll head south to see the labyrinths. And here you can see this survey that I mentioned earlier from the 1983 article, which shows the um, historic labyrinths on the island. So this map doesn't even include uh, any labyrinths that were built after 1980, which is probably 10 more. But you can see there's just labyrinths uh, all throughout the island, you know, from every uh, corner of the island uh, and through the center. So um, we'll, we'll get uh, three days in the city uh, with the history and the museums, and then we'll have three days um, traveling around um, to see many of these sacred sites. You know, and an example would just be this one here in uh, Bunga. Uh, and, you know, you can just see this opportunity to connect with the stones and the, the different um, designs. They're mostly classical labyrinths, um, but they can be seven circuit, uh, 11 circuit or 15 circuit classical <laughs> labyrinths. And this one has a unique um, design where there's actually a cross uh, made out of these four stones um, in, this, in the center of the pattern. Um, and we'll be culminating our trip with the Midsummer Celebration, which I've actually not experienced uh, on Gotland before. So this will be a really uh, exciting uh, conclusion to our trip on Friday. Uh, they're going to have a traditional raising of the midsummer pole and dancing around the the pole with songs and music. And um, maybe Valerie, do you want to share a little bit about the the midsummer tradition? Yeah. So as we're talking about rituals, you cannot get a bigger ritual than midsummer. Um, the island will be alive 
And well, so the sun, the solstice means the sun's standing still. The sun will not set that day. And usually it doesn't set for about three days. And it's known as the white nights. But um, midsummer is always celebrated the Friday after or closest to the actual summer solstice. So Visby is having a wonderful occasion. We always raise a pole. We, we would call it a maypole. In Swedish, it's called a maistong. And we sing around it. And you'll see all generations gather to sing around the maistong. And we do actions with the songs. And then we always eat pickled herring, Swedish meatballs, uh, potatoes. And there's a special midsummer cake. It's a white cake and strawberries on top. And lots of singing, lots of dancing, lots of drinking. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Well, thankfully, we can just roll down the hill to the, to the, there actually is going to be a parade. So we'll, <laughs> we'll make our crowns and then we'll, we'll parade down to the main mm -hmm. square where we'll have the, the midsummer celebration. And then we have Saturday, uh, we'll have our, closing kind of final walk of uh, one of the old labyrinths north of town and then a, a closing dinner um, to share with you all. So just a little bit more about Gotland. Uh, as you can see, as we venture out on the island, you'll see these especially little fishing villages with these little uh, huts all with this uh, kind of Swedish red color. Um, and this is an example of the 15 circuit labyrinth at the um, lighthouse uh, to the north, um, created by the grandfather of the, the hotel uh, owner or keeper um, that we're staying with, which is just incredible. Um, um, and here is a little bit more. You can see some of the Viking history as you walk around uh, the island, these old stone ships, which were burial grounds for some of the, the Viking captains and the medieval wall that that um, encloses the city and, and protected it. Um, it is the best preserved uh, medieval city in all of Scandinavia. And for that reason, it's the UNESCO uh, heritage site. Um, and Val, you just shared some interesting news about the, um, mm. the medieval churches. There's 94 um, medieval churches that are uh, either Gothic or Romanesque style, um, and most of them are in, in pretty good condition and still in use. They may have one minister that teach, you know, that preaches, <clears throat> you know, in a kind of a circuit of two or three different churches, but they, you know, in that way, they all have continual kind of use, so... Mm. So um, now those 94 Gothic and Romanesque churches are becoming their own UNESCO heritage site. So there will always be funding there to keep them um, up, to, well, up to date as much as the 12th century will allow you to be up to date <laughs> to keep them, keep them you know, in good preservation and good condition. Yeah, and some of them include labyrinths on the inside of the church, but not laid mm -hmm. in the floor like in Chart. These are kind of graffiti labyrinths or frescoes that are painted in the back of the, the church. And we're not really sure why, but we can visit at least two of the churches and see um, these uh, either etched uh, labyrinths or painted labyrinths, like you can see the one here um, with, again, maybe a maiden or someone in the labyrinth uh, uh, walking the circuits or dancing. <laughs> Uh, and here's the stone labyrinth north of town, um, which again is one of the older labyrinths on the island. And uh, you can see here is, a, we're going to have a walking tour of the town and you can see um, the Santa Maria church uh, and then also some of the ruins here. This is an old warehouse um, from medieval times with kind of like the stepped roof and the wall there. Um, and this is actually a funny <laughs> story. This is the the ruins of St. Lars, you know, which Lars is actually the derivation of Lawrence. So this would be St. Lawrence Church. But um, when I walked into the St. Lars uh, ruins, I realized it had this gravel floor. So I just took the heel of my shoe and sketched out this labyrinth uh, and created one um, just for the group to walk. And the these ruined churches have no roofs. So it's incredible to be standing 
you know, immense these columns and this uh, architecture, but then to look up and see just the beautiful blue sky above. Um, so here is the St. Mary's Cathedral, which I just found out was consecrated in 1225, which is really almost exactly uh, in alignment with Chartres. So um, it was a smaller church when it was consecrated and the cathedral itself was built up over time. But um, you can see uh, within walking distance from our hotel will be this cathedral. And in front of the cathedral is a stone labyrinth. Uh, it was actually only uh, put in in 1985, uh, but there's this really interesting square um, labyrinth there uh, that's out outdoors in front of the cathedral. And here you just see kind of walking around the medieval town, uh, the cobblestone streets. So if you've been to Chartres Cathedral and, and Chartres, you you kind of have this sense of being in a medieval city and it's 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 similar but different. Um, you know, this is an island and you really get that kind of island feel in some ways, you know, like being on Iona. It's like if Iona and Chart were combined, you'd have Gotland or, <laughs> you know, they each have their own, their own, uh, you know, personality, but they also share in this, you know, in this rich uh, spiritual history and tradition and sense of the sacred. Ah, so here's the Hotel St. Clemens. So this is really incredible. Uh, Valerie found this hotel. And as we mentioned before, the hotel keeper was like, you know, I'm interested about this labyrinth tour because my grandparents built labyrinths and um, they have their own ruin in the backyard of the hotel. So this is actually a ruin that they um, said we could use for our morning sessions. And, uh, and so we will be out in the, in the ruins of this St. Clemens. And, uh, and that will also be our home for um, uh, the folks who sign up first. <laughs> and then we have another hotel uh, called the Strand Hotel, which has um, also a uh, little more amenities. And uh, it has a pool and a bar and a restaurant with some uh, food at night. So there's there's kind of two um, places that we will be based, and we've reserved a block of rooms at both um, hotels so that we all uh, have a place uh, to be. And here you can just see some of the food, which is delightful on the island. A lot of uh, local fresh ingredients. Uh, Swedes are very much into organic food and farming, and you can see you know the scallops. Um, and the, the fish is incredible if you're into salmon or um, seafood. And um, there's incredible asparagus and farms. And as Valerie mentioned, the fika with their baked goods and coffee. Um, and this farm, Lila Beers, actually, they have a labyrinth in the in the front of the farm. And the, the owner built it for her children. Uh, and... Um, you know, she tells a story about how they uh, used to practice riding the unicycle <laughs> through the labyrinth <laughs> because they went off to the circus. So yeah, you can <laughs> just see, you know, how many different ways the labyrinth is in use. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to decide if we should get into more specifics or we should ask general questions. I know uh, some of you may be here just to hear about, you know, the island of Gotland and the idea of the tour and things of that nature. And some of you have already paid your deposit and are ready to like, you know, how do I get there and, and what do I do? So um, maybe we should open it just for one or two questions in general about the island, um, about the tour, and then we will say farewell to anybody who was just here for, for interest. Um, we hope to do it again next year if you can't join us this year. Um, so it is something we hope to do again uh, in the future. Um, you know, And uh, as I said, I've done it twice before. This is the third time that we're leading the pilgrimage and we just keep to hope doing it You know, as there's interest. Um, Thank you for your interest and your time, and and we appreciate you. Uh, hope to join you on the tour and pilgrimage this year, or you know, if not this one, then sometime down the road. So, uh, thank you. Peace on your path. Thank Be you well. Very much.